mostly just so mostly just so we are you know kind of know who we're talking with um and uh it's it's also useful for future um programming and it's of course not going to let me launch my poll that is very interesting when that happens <laughs> i think about once every fifth time i don't know if you can do it lisa my colleague lisa garfield is with future harvest and she's um helping run the back end with us and also as a soil scientist is a great person to have as part of the conversation we will just um, do the poll manually if it doesn't seem to want to go um, just it, it tells me i'm logged in from another device so that doesn't make any sense to me it's it's, it's up elizabeth oh is it excellent couldn't see it so for those of you who maybe can't see it or um you know if you're on your phone or whatever what we're doing is asking why you're here basically are you a farmer do you want to become a farmer are you a service provider or a researcher or an ag retailer or something else and um, we are interested in knowing what soil health opportunities you'd like to learn more about and we have a whole list of things and we've asked you to choose your top three um, so, uh, you can just those into not able to act I'll carry on while folks are filling that out. Lisa, when you're ready, you can shut me up and we'll um, we'll see how that worked out. This is really just a true snapshot of some of the work of the Million Acre Challenge. Uh, it includes our work with the PASA Soil Health Benchmark Study, which Lisa heads up, as well as opportunities like this one, which happen monthly, and our advanced farmer networks that bring farmers into conversation with each other. The important thing to remember is that we are a farmer focused initiative. We really do see farmers as the experts and we recognize that they're doing the best that they can to steward the land with the tools that they have available to them. And we wanna help make even more tools available and support that effort. What we'd like you to do, maybe even as you're sitting here finishing up your poll, um, is take a minute to pop over to our website, see what's there. Um, you'll have an opportunity there to um, sign up for our monthly newsletter. Um, you'll also have an opportunity there for farmers to enroll. And what enrollment means is that we simply have a better sense of what your farm operation looks like. It doesn't commit you to something. You're not pledging any particular practices. You don't have to be at a certain place to be part of the Million Acre Challenge. We are on a journey together. Uh, we also encourage you to look at our social media pages, um, especially Facebook and Instagram. That's a really good way to stay up to date with what we're um, offering. And I just wanted to, if I can do it, I wanted to pop into chat the link to our most recent newsletter so folks that didn't get that can see it. All right, Lisa, do you want to? Um... Sure. Uh, yeah, I ended the poll and it looks like we've got a few farmers, a couple service providers, and ag retailers with us today and some interest in funding opportunities for soil health practices, farm diversification, and reducing um, fertilizer and herbicide use. So a nice selection of topics. Thank you. That's great. Um, at the moment, we have lost our farmer. He has been, <laughs> he has been dropped off the call uh, and he's trying to get back in. So we'll carry on here um and hope that he's able to to come back in uh, i'd love for him to be here for this but he doesn't have to be this is really just an opportunity for me to brag about him a little bit and to tell you guys a, a bit more about his operation um i think it's interesting uh, we don't run into this all that often um 
but Brad is a first generation farmer on land that his family has owned since the 1930s. Um, no one else in his family had uh, has opted to farm the land themselves. Um, so I find that to be particularly interesting. He comes from an engineering background. Uh, Garrettdale Farm is about 164 acres and Brad is currently um, running about 45 uh, Lester long wool sheep and um, a handful of beef cattle that he describes as mutts. I'll let him tell you more about that in a few minutes. Uh, he is practicing rotational grazing uh, and is introducing small grain production as part of his efforts to launch a malting business called Bear Branch Malt. And we will um, we'll get to talk about that a little bit more in the near future as well. Get, at this point, Brad, thank you so much for being here. And I am going to sort of hand the talking stick over to you and we'll go through with some some questions back and forth together um, as you tell us a little bit more about your operation, starting kind of with the history, because I think it's fascinating. All right, so uh, I just missed a couple minutes there because of some internet issues, but uh, so the family history here, a uh, few pictures are showing my great grandparents with my grandfather. Uh, they purchased the farm in the late 30s and uh, bought it as a place to escape the city. Uh, they were living in downtown Baltimore at the time, and uh, they had a car, so they were able to kind of drive out and spend the weekends out here, and they would uh, help the farmers. There was always a tenant here, or we'd um, uh, rent the land out to a neighboring farmer or somebody in the area, but uh, they would help with um, equipment purchases or helping run the equipment. My great-grandfather was also an engineer, um, so he liked to play with tools and toys outside and uh, had definitely had an interest in farming. There's a lot of old books here that um, came with the house that I live in. I live in their old, uh, what was their vacation house. Um, and then, so this picture here is my grandfather. And uh, he was always a, a big supporter of what, what I've been working on here. That's great. Um, when did you kind of get the, the inclination that you thought you were gonna jump into farming? Uh, uh, you know, having having engineering under your belt when I know an awful lot of farmers need to be um, pretty savvy about engineering kinds of projects, but that's an interesting transition. Yeah, uh, the engineering degree is definitely helpful. Um, but uh, so when I was a kid, I was always interested because I'd, I'd ride around in the combine with uh, the guy that was farming the, the farm at the time and um, always kind of had uh, like childhood dreams of doing the farm thing, but the realities uh, were always different. And, you know, in the, the I guess like through the 90s, like looking at farming, it was always from my perspective, like a big commodity, uh, hard to enter, lots of expensive equipment. And um, the farmers that I knew were like, not doing well it's it was hard and it was hard to make a profit and it was always uh kind of a, a scary thing to get through the year and so it didn't seem like an option um and then um so i pursued engineering and worked in the engineering field for 10 years doing product design and um, worked in the commuter rail car industry for a little while and a few things in between um also worked for Siemens doing building automation. So like HVAC controls and stuff like that, which has all come in very handy. Um, just a lot less paperwork on the farm most days. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about the land and uh, you, you and I shared some um, discussion about how the land has been managed over the years and where it is kind of now. Yeah, so um, the, the yellow line there is the property boundary. And so you can see we have a lot of fields. They are all in grass in some form, um, at least in this picture here. Right now, we have um, about 10 acres that we've transitioned into barley and rye, which is still technically back into grass again. Um, but uh, half of these fields um, I fenced in um, using an equip program. Uh, so we got some funding to put in high tensile electric fence uh, and a bunch of buried water lines and um, a new well. Um, it was a great project that, that kicked things off to be able to do rotational grazing at a pretty good scale. Um, the other half of the farm, the, the tillable fields are 
rented to a neighbor and um, he makes hay. So it's, it's you know, always uh, undisturbed soil through there. And then you can see we have all these lines of forest everywhere. There's um, four smaller streams and then a larger creek that runs across the bottom of the property line there in the woods. So we've got a lot of waterways and um, pretty wide tree forest buffers on, on everything. Even, even our seasonal streams are pretty well buffered. Um, some of the more narrow tree strips um, we do graze in um, throughout the year off and on. And that's something I want to try and expand on. It seems to be doing some pretty great things to the forest. Nice. So uh, we've talked about engineering and we've talked about, uh, you know, sort of your entree into farming. Um, <laughs> let's talk about hops. So, um, yeah, my my real like intro into farming, what, what kind of led me into the door of really uh, trying something was uh, hops. So the plan was to build a small scale hop harvester. It was, you know, almost 15 years ago now um, that kind of got the bug. Um, and uh, there was a lot of small hop farms popping up on the East Coast and there was no real easy way to pick these things unless you ordered something that was uh, like a really old machine in Europe that gets cut in half and stuffed into a sea container. And it's, it was a lot of work to try to harvest hops. So um, started a small hop yard, have about an, uh, an acre of trellis that you can see in the pictures there. Um, the hops, um, it's a lot of work. It's hard. And um, there's, especially when I first started, I think the first hops went in the ground maybe 12 years ago here. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of info uh, on how to grow them on the East Coast in general. Uh, so it was a lot of trial and error, more error than anything, I'd say. Um, but that led me to find that in New Zealand, people were using sheep to graze in their hop yards to remove basal foliage and keep the dry rows mowed and that sort of thing. Uh, so I got a couple of sheep and um, now I have um, 45 sheep, um, no hops to harvest. The, the trellis is still there. It will circle back as a priority eventually, but um, the farm grew in a different way and we pivoted and um, we'll, we'll definitely circle back to this. Uh, it's a really interesting thing to have, especially along with our malt uh, to offer, but um, the sheep took off and the, the, the project started, it was a four acre uh, field that we fenced in here that included the hop yard and it quickly turned to about 45 acres fenced in once we kicked that equip project off and uh, started started grazing rotationally and, and that's what kind of uh, drew me in to, to continuing the the farm journey was um, learning all about you know raising livestock and what they can do uh, when raised in the right system. I wonder if there are some sheep producers in the room who heard you say the sheep took off and had a moment of, you know, panic. Uh, it's just funny how that can be taken in more than one way. Um, oh, yeah, they've, they've taken off. Before I got the equip, uh, the fencing in, uh, I was using electric netting throughout all, most of these fields to move them around. And uh, it doesn't take much of a breeze or the wrong weather or a branch to come down and they will just go and hang out in your neighbor's yard immediately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, putting a pin in getting establishing good relationships with your neighbors, right? Uh -huh. So um, this, the image on the lower right in this slide um, is a depiction of your sort of multi-species cover crop. And I know that's an important part of your operation, um, uh, but so is um, a diversity of livestock. So let's kind of explore how, how you've moved into that um, decision-making process. Yeah, so the, the picture in the last slide shows um, it was a cover crop planted into the drive rows using a no-till drill. And that was to try to, you know, keep good soil life going and also to incentivize the, the sheep to, to graze in there a little bit more thoroughly and to have some uh, material to, to keep the soil covered with. Um, this was from uh, it, we would go up to New York for the annual hop growers conference and University of Vermont was always up there um, with a lot of lessons learned. And they were doing some really interesting stuff with trap crops and um, trying to get um, 
uh, various predators to to come in to to eliminate um, different pests in the hops and that sort of thing. And so that's really where I started to be informed on uh, more experimental ways of of kind of keeping the soil going and keeping you know crops going in parallel with it. Um, and so this is some kind of a, it was a, like a three or four way mix of rye and crimson clover and vetch and I forget what else it's, it's been a few years now um, but then yeah so the next slide is the the Lester Longwell sheep so um, kind of fell into the breed a friend of mine uh, Tom Bars and Carol Ann McConaughey they they raised this breed and they have been for many years now and so they own Milk House Brewery and so I was working with them because they were also growing hops and so he said oh here here's a couple sheep to try out and it just took off um, and uh, it started with just like a couple of uh, weather ram uh, combo uh, to to help graze and decided to buy a few ewes and use one of the rams for uh, breeding and learned a lot over the years so I kind of went from scratch knowing nothing or very little about livestock other than you know friends growing up they were in 4-H and um, I was in rabbit club for a couple of years as a small kid <laughs> it doesn't really help you much uh, with large animal stuff but so the, this breed is pretty interesting it's a dual purpose um, it was really developed to, to um, have a really nice fiber that's sought after by craftspeople for spinning and um, various fiber projects, but the the meat is also excellent. So it's a really mild flavor. Um, they they fill out on grass really well. I don't feed them anything. Every now and then they try and steal some some scraps that I feed to the cows every now and then. But these uh, these sheep excel out in the field for sure. So speaking of cows. Uh, yes. Tell us about your mutts. So uh, the the past several years, I've been buying steers from various farms, and um, just to kind of have some some additional animal units and some beef to to grow. Um, but the challenge was that every time I get genetics from somewhere else, they would you know perform differently, and harvest times were varying, and it was a challenge. So this past year, an opportunity came by to purchase a a small herd of cows here and they are um they're what i was looking for was um devon red devon um but in general uh what i really wanted was cows that do well on grass only um so this particular mix the uh, the large cow in the front with the horns there she's mostly devon uh at least three quarter um but everybody else is uh, a pretty interesting mix of devon dexter Shorthorn, uh, low line Angus, um, really a, a lot of really great grass genetics just kind of mixed in. And the, um, the other important thing that I was looking for is that they came from a similar system. So they were about um, maybe 20 minutes away on another farm that um, was pretty hands off with their management. So same with the sheep. Um, I've been working pretty hard to develop a, a flock that would do well on their own let the sheep be sheep and let the cows be cows so um, as much as they can you know if there's an issue we'll bring them in but uh, we try to lamb and calve out on pasture um, feed very little to nothing um, we, we'll feed some hay throughout the winter but for the most part we're we have them out grazing all year as long as we've got enough uh, stockpile weather permitting so i think that the sound on this video will probably not come through. It actually doesn't matter if it does talking. Um, but I just want you all to get a sense of the pasture composition and then we'll move on to how Brad is uh, kind of managing his pastures. So th yeah, this was a, a cover crop that uh, was ready right when uh, a new group of steers was coming from another farm. And uh, you can kind of see that, you know, you let them out and they're pretty excited to see a whole different mix of things that they had not really experienced before. They came from pretty standard fescue orchard grass pasture. And this was like mature triticale and crimson clover. And uh, if you've got a really good eye, you can see that it's probably 50% goldenrod. Um, <laughs> and that was something that we've been trying to work with cover crops um, to get rid of. Um, 
and I think there's a, a few pictures down. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, so the one on the left there is it's almost all goldenrod, and some of these fields, like we, you know, we fenced in 45 acres and had six sheep. Um, so some of this stuff we we were kind of making hay on, but it was um, some of the these fields were in uh, CRP, the conservation program, where they were mowed once a year. And some of them kind of got out of control and, and um, uh, less desirable things were there. I won't call them all weeds because they were still doing some good for the soil <laughs> some way. Um, but uh, for this particular field, it was, it was a challenge to decide what to do. Um, we did spray Roundup on this pasture and um, with the current mindset, that's probably the last time we'll spray it an herbicide in that way, like on, on an entire field, um, at least, you know, with what we've learned about soil health since we did this, but I was afraid to plow for the same reasons. You know, you it's like lose, lose, you can plow and lose all of your soil or you spray an herbicide and lose some critical microbial life or, you know, you know runoff pollution, lots of different things you can look at, human health stuff. Uh, so we did spray here, but so we, we first, um, we sprayed after grazing hard, mowing, um, and we, it took a while, timing was poor, uh, this no-till drill was out uh, on the November 25th of 2020, from what I remember, um, which is pretty late, uh, that was a good lesson learned, don't bother that late, <laughs> at least uh, that year with that weather. Uh, this year, maybe we could pull it off. Um, but then, so the, the photo there on the right um, shows what um, came up that following season, and that's what those steers were let out on. And um, so we were, in, the intention was to, you know, get whatever weeds uh, or seeds uh, to germinate in that field along with this cover crop. And it was, it was a pretty light seeding rate because we knew there was just going to be a bunch of stuff in there. It wasn't really going to be a great stand right off the bat with with what we knew was there previous. Um, so we we grazed that and um, this uh, you'll see down the line here that this field eventually is a, uh, the field that we planted in barley this year. Um, so the process took a little while but it did work well. So Brad uh, we are coming up we, we're at 1224 so I want to just kind of maybe move through the next couple of slides slides pretty quickly because you have touched on some of these um, concepts of you know how you're how you're feeding your animals. Yeah yeah so um, this is at uh, at least one on the left of the same field and um, this is a, another uh, mix cover crop that came up here and then we've got um, both sheep and cattle grazing at the same time but the important thing to focus on here is bale grazing. Um, that has been uh, my favorite tool and probably most impactful tool. Uh, some of our thinner soil areas are where we're seeing the the most persistent weeds and uh, the best way to get rid of them is impact and uh, bale grazing is impact and seeding all in one. Um, and I've, I've seen some really great results at small patches, but we continue to kind of grow these areas out and um, it's been a really low effort way to, to turn some of these field areas around. Uh, so this, this is a shot of our, our sheep grazing and uh, with a pretty relatively thick ice storm. Um, they do have a nice hay stash that they have access to. And instead they uh, like to dig through those tufts of brown fescue and find all the good stuff in the middle. So we, we basically, we keep everybody grazing all winter long. And um, as long as you have a good stockpile early on, there, there'll be something there for them. Uh, this is uh, a good shot of all the sheep and cows together, and um, this is a field in later slides you see we, uh, this year we turn from pasture to um, uh, rye that will be malting. Uh, so I'm going to interject a, a question from the chat. Um, Mark is asking, how was the overall soil health from when you started and where is it now? So um, we'll find out a lot more about where it is right now because uh, Lisa was just out uh, pulling a lot of great soil samples for the soil benchmark study that we just enrolled in. Um, the soil health early on was, it depended on where you were. I mean, parts of the farm were really eroded and the soil was thin and it's still thin um, just because we've been slowly building um, our, 
our flock and herd to, to make a bigger impact. Um, but it's definitely improving. Um, and uh, yeah, it's more kind of time will tell to be able to give you a, a good analytical answer to that. Thanks for the question, Mark. Um, Brad, the, the contrast in the photo on the left from you know where the animals were to a new, a new section um, is pretty impressive. And I know you uh, have mentioned that watering is always a, a bit of a hurdle for rotational grazers. Yeah, so this shot is um, early spring of this year. And so we're kind of, at this time, we're trying to move everybody along the farm kind of quickly and just kind of cream off what's there, not do too much of an impact um, because we want a nice thick stand to come up through that cool season growth. Um, but there's, you can see there's lots of good residual material there that it would have been ideal to have a little bit more of that knocked down, but we're continuing to increase our, our animal units so that we can have uh, uh, more impact on our grazing in, in shorter time in the field. Uh, and then on the right there is our water uh, set up for remote parts of the farm. Through Equip, we did do a lot of water lines. So we have a couple of uh, freeze proof waters around and permanent stations, but um, to break parasite cycles and to break fly cycles, um, moving water while you're moving your fences is pretty critical. Um, if they're always coming back to that same point in the middle of the farm to get water throughout the day, uh, flies will remain an issue and you'll end up figuring out ways to treat for that. And, and with the sheep, uh, parasites are a huge problem if you let them go back to where they were too soon. So same deal. Um, and uh, so it's on the front of the tractor is a 350 gallon water tote with a valve on the bottom and on top is just a big uh, water trough. It's upside down in the picture and we just kind of flip it over. You can handle it with by hand and just kind of flip it onto the ground and open the valve and you've got a few days of water there or a day and you can just kind of shovel it around. Nice. Um, so I'm conscious of time and I want to just be sure that we sort of touch on the small grain aspect. I will warn folks that the malting business is was tucked in at the end. So if you can stick around a little longer, that's when we're going to be able to discuss um, where Brad is going with that uh, via the, the avenue of the small grains. So uh, here, this is the, the field that we've been kind of looking at in the other photos um, where we were doing a couple cover crops. We did some grazing. Um, we grazed as much as we could and then went through and mowed very short uh, and then came in with a moldboard plow, disked, cultipacked, used a, a broadcast spreader and um, got um, seven acres of barley down and about three and a half of rye with this method. And we've got a pretty healthy stand coming up. Um, next year, I'll be using a drill. My goal is to have a no-till drill on the farm. And um, for changing over from pasture to, to our, our crop, whatever it ends up being, um, we'll continue to plow, but we'll probably switch to a chisel plow. Um, but anytime we can, my plan is to uh, use the no-till drill and um, get some uh, cover crops in that we can actually use a roller crimper for, but that's, that's all gonna be continued development and experimenting, um, but the, the end all be all goal is to uh, reduce tillage as much as possible and to avoid herbicides and, and run with it from there. So this is barley on the right, is that correct? Yeah, barley on the right. And then on the left is that field that we saw, uh, it's got the hop yard there and the, the, we had the mixed species picture. So we changed that over this season for rye. That's a Danko rye. So we'll be malting both those. That's excellent. All right, I am going to just real quickly skip ahead. You guys are gonna get a breeze through of these slides. Um, just to thank those of you who do need to leave right at 1230, um, appreciate your interest. Um, Brad uh, has offered to have us list his email address in chat, which Lisa has just put in, as well as um, his website address. The malting business is Bear Branch Malt. So if you wanna uh, check that out in the future, I, I know Brad would appreciate that. That is a, definitely a work in progress, um, but it's exciting. Um, so if anybody needs to drop off, feel free. Otherwise we're gonna back up again and we're gonna uh, talk about this malting business. All right, so um... From the, from the get-go, uh, you know, the hops being a, like a specialty crop and 
planning on selling it to direct to breweries or better yet have a brewery on the farm and, and make a value added product. Um, that's been the key focus is uh, to make a go of it on uh, a relatively small farm, I guess, uh, at a, you know, 160 acres or so. Uh, so we raise beef and lamb, sell direct to consumers. Um, so we uh, try and fill people's freezers. And, but we also uh, sell various fiber products. Uh, a new thing that we're, we're working on is green earth wool, which is a wool mulch that you can use in your garden or your flower pots, out on your patio, that sort of thing. Um, but also we have um, sheep pelts that are beautiful and um, is one of my favorite products and our couch is covered in them and they're comfortable and awesome. And uh, we also sell raw fleece to um, various craftspeople, people that are spinners, or um, we'll send some off to a mill here pretty soon. Tomorrow is actually shearing day. Uh, so we'll have I don't even know now with with uh, 45 sheep, we'll probably have you know, hundreds of pounds of wool to uh, turn into various things. So we'll, we'll be sending some of that off and we'll have some spun, uh, potentially some even woven into some fabric. Uh, and then my main focus these days is uh, the malting business, uh, Bear Branch Malt. And so this is uh, a shot of our current small scale system. This is like the proof of concept. It's a small salad in box where uh, we're able to make about 1200 pounds of malt a week. And we just finished up a batch of Pilsner about 35 minutes ago. I was right down to the wire to get here. Um, and then we'll start another batch this evening. Uh, we'll probably run some pale or some dark Munich. Uh, but so this system has been running for um, over five years now. Uh, it's been on here on the farm for a year. And before that it was at a rented facility in Cooksville. Uh, so you're seeing it set up at the, the last place um, we're building a new facility on the farm currently and um, have some larger equipment coming in. So we'll be going from our half ton system to this larger four ton system. So that's a picture of me on the right with uh, unloading the, uh, the new supply skid, which is uh, the, the main uh, guts of our, our malting process and that will be what controls uh, temperatures it's a big furnace uh, as well as um, uh, cooling and humidification and air control automated dampers that sort of thing so we can really precisely dial in each each, uh, each batch of malt um, super exciting um... All right. Well, that actually brings us to the end of our slides, which means that uh, those of you who are um, listening in have the option now to uh, ask your questions, uh, explore things that you heard that you're curious uh, to learn more about. Um, I'll jump back to this slide one more time. And then, uh, and then we're just going to take the slide share down and let you guys come on camera and um, have some conversation. Um, Brad, again, thank you very much. This is, uh, we're excited for you uh, and we're glad that you're doing all of this work with an eye for um, regeneration and soil health. Um, that, that's really, really great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Questions, anyone? Um, okay, Mao Chan says, any experience with combining the sheep with fruit trees? Um, sort of. We did just plant a bunch of small trees uh, in the yard here, and we, we grazed sheep all the way up to the backyard of the house. Um, while they're small, you definitely need to keep the sheep away. They really like the leaves. Um, but as far as uh, in like a production model, no, no experience. Um, they... Uh, they can reach uh, a good four feet. So you, you would want some pretty well matured trees. That was always the challenge uh, grazing the sheep and the hops was the hops being new plantings, they take a good three or four years to get um, really you know, mature and fast growing. Um, and that's only if you don't make any mistakes, me being a, a new grower and not be, having a lot of resources, it took a while. 
Um, and uh, so we that was the challenge was timing with with uh, intergrazing is having your crop sturdy enough to withstand uh, sheep coming through. We have another question in chat from Justin who wants to know a little more about the mulch wool product. Yeah, so um, it's something we are just kind of now releasing and dropping off samples out of various uh, uh, plant shops in the area and that sort of thing that the plan is to uh, sell it from the small one pound bag that you saw there um, to kind of whatever volume somebody's looking for. If it's a larger landscape project, we can do a larger package. But um, yeah, the, uh, the, the idea is to use it as, as a mulch that is a little bit more permanent than something just kind of woody that would quickly go into the soil, but it also does um, offer um, nutrients as you're watering your plants or as it's raining. There's in raw wool, there's uh, there's plenty of stuff from the field or from the, the back of the animal that is going to be in that wool that uh, helps out the plants. So it's um, really good for keeping moisture in the soil um, adding some nutrients and uh, keeping weeds down. I love the idea of that closed system uh, using the products that you have. Lisa, you came off off mute. I did. I'm curious uh, if you've had a nutrient analysis done of the the wool mulch. No, do you have any um, idea? It, it would be pretty interesting to do, and um, the plan is to have more than one. Uh, that some will have more nutrients than others. I would say so. When when you're going through, so tomorrow when we're shearing, we'll be. Um, what's called skirting the wool. So uh, it, when the shear uh, removes all of the wool, it comes off as they go through their process. It's like a, a mat that's almost together. Um, so the perimeter of that mat is a lot of belly wool and stuff on the legs and the rear end. And that's usually either has manure in it or um, bits and pieces from the field. And it's just not the primo wool that we want to sell to, to artisans and craftspeople. Um, so that's what gets pulled off. Um, a lot of that is great for clean mulch and some of it is pretty filthy, but for gardening, it can be filthy in a really good way. So some will have more nutrients than others. And uh, so we'll have a product that's more of a fertilizer mulch and one that's more of just like a nice clean mulch. So that may, that's an interesting, it's an interesting concept. I've not come across it before. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how it can be used. Um, like, is it gonna have to be treated like uh, raw manure or compost that has manure in it? Or are people gonna need to uh, think about those um, days to harvest if they're yeah, using Yeah, yeah. For some of it, um, you may have to think about it. For most of the clean wool, uh, it, it's, it's pretty irrelevant and, um, but uh, yeah, it'll depend on which product you go with. <laughs> Others have questions? Um, do you have other byproducts coming off out of the malting process that could potentially be, I mean, or um, Justin is from the veteran compost uh, company. So I'm oh, sure that awesome. that, uh, that yeah, so um, we, um, as we were just out there unloading our Pilsner malt and a byproduct is um, malt fines is what it's called and more of like the commodity industry. It's um, all the, the rootlets that we knock off the, the malt when it's finished, um, the dust, um, the smalls, so like the kernels that don't, uh, don't meet our size standard, that sort of thing. It all just gets sifted out, comes out the other end. Um, there's also a, a shop back that's collecting a lot of dust. So that all goes together. Um, and then we, we have a, um, a feeding trough that we move around with the water. So as we're moving our grazing around, we've got a trough out and we'll feed that to the cattle. Um, it's not enough to make, um, to really shift them to being like a grain finished animal. It's a really small amount of their total dry matter intake, but, um, it makes them very easy to move. They love it. It's a really great treat for them. They woof it down and, um, it, you know, it's, it's a tool in more than one way. You know, I mean, it's good for them nutrient wise. They, they definitely seem to thrive, especially in the winter time. We'll focus on feeding it out then when, when we're more feeding hay and they have less of the good stuff. 
<clears throat> excuse me. And um, but uh, it also takes that, you know, crop material that would have gone elsewhere if if the process was going off farm and we're able to put as much back into those fields through the cattle um, and it basically, you know, turns it into manure that's ready to, to feed the soil immediately. Um, before there's one more question in the chat, but before we move on to that, because we're still a little bit on topic. Um, do you foresee your malting facility having capacity to process other um, grain from other farmers or are you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Any... So um, for the most part, um, all of my grain comes from within 20 minutes from the farm. Um, but there, there's some farms in the area that I've partnered with for years now, and they're really good at what they do. Um, they've, they've been growing some great barley, wheat, rye for us, and I will continue to lean on them uh, do it using their tried and true successful methods as I do more experimental stuff here and focus on soil health and uh, limited tillage and try to work this small grain into our farm system. Um, and then uh, that allows us to have some some failures along the way and, and it allows us to take some bigger risks and hopefully make some progress. Uh, also on topic, and I don't want to ignore your question, um, but a real quick expl exploration of the value of uh, the malted barley. Uh, we talked about that a little bit, but I haven't heard it come up here quite in the same way. Yeah, so. Um... Barley was a pretty popular crop in the area not that long ago. Um, and then there became a point where the straw was more valuable than the barley itself on the market. Um, and then it became more of a, a cover crop that was planted just due to um, the incentives that are out there. And um, now you'll see a lot of these barley cover crops are being uh, sprayed with an herbicide and, and then no-tilled on top of, which is a relatively good method as far as conservation relative to what we've done in the past, but it would be ideal to take these crops further, harvest them, um, which is where the, the malting barley comes in because it's actually, uh, it has a, a value to it that makes it worthwhile. So. Uh, malting barley on average is uh, at least the past few years has been about double um, the commodity price of barley. Uh, so it's, it, it does need to meet higher quality standards. Uh, Don levels need to be uh, below one part per million for human consumption and um, kernel size is, is critical. Protein levels need to be low. There's, there's things that the growers need to pay more attention to um, but the, the inputs to do that aren't really a lot. Um, it's, it's worthwhile to pay a little bit more attention to the barley and then double the value of it for, uh, for a malting crop instead of just uh, a regular feed barley. And meanwhile, you've introduced a small grain into, into your crop rotation if you, if you can. Um, yeah. we have, we're right at 1245. I don't want to ignore uh, the question of um, how you control the breeding, um, you know, eight sheep and uh, lots of lots of them are pregnant and a little unsure um, what what's happening there. How are you managing that? Yeah, really good fences um, helps. It can be a challenge. We've definitely had years where uh, a ram busts through a fence because uh, this time of year, I don't know if you guys noticed, there's kind of deer running everywhere right now. They're especially antlered bucks. Um, it is full on rut season and the sheep typically follow that, especially here. Um, and the deer will barrel through traffic to get to a doe and sheep will go through walls to <laughs> get into another field and breed. So it, I, uh, I recommend long distance separation. We usually have multiple paddocks between our ewes and our rams. And um, ideally, don't have any rams on the farm. Um, most of ours are weathers. We have two rams that we keep an eye on. Um, and the, the goal is to kind of just get that down to one ram that is from another farm or from another flock. Uh, so find somebody else in the area or wherever that has um, 
you know, uh, nice breeding stock that you want to bring in and, and get rid of anything that is uh, related because um, they, they will try and find a way to, to mate. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up. Uh, if you missed it, Brad's email and website addresses are in chat. Um, if you scroll back up just a little bit, you'll find those. This will also be posted to um, the Million Acre Challenge YouTube channel as soon as I can get it up there. So um, you can go back and watch it again or share it with folks that you think might benefit from the information that Brad has so generously offered to us today. I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, happy hump day. And uh, <laughs> Brad, uh, our hats are off to you. Thank you guys very much for having me.